if we don't get our behaviors right and aligned with what we claim to value within our, our program and what we're trying to teach our players, none of it works. Welcome to the Coaches Club Podcast, powered by Transform Sport where we believe great coaches transform lives, athletes deserve great coaches, and coaches deserve great training. I'm your host, Luke Gromer, and every week we're bringing you conversations with coaches and leaders in sport that will help you grow as an effective teacher and transformational leader so that you and your team can reach your potential. Coaches, I'm excited to welcome JP Nurbin to the Coaches Club podcast. JP is the founder of Thrive on Challenge and the host of the Coaching Culture podcast. In his own words, he's just a coach trying to help other coaches. Through Thrive on Challenge, JP provides mentorship and consulting to coaches to help them build stronger cultures. I have a ton of respect for JP. Not only is the content he shares high quality and extremely valuable for coaches, but he's a coach that walks the walk. He's authentic and he's in it to serve coaches and athletes. I'd highly recommend his podcast or any of his online courses. Today, we dive into the impact of coaches' behaviors on culture, how to align your staff, how to deal with playing time issues, and a lot more. Before we get into the episode, two quick things. First, if you want a detailed copy of the notes from this episode, go to transformsport.org slash podnotes or click the link in the show details. If you're already on my email list, just click the link in the email I send out every Monday to get the show notes from this episode. Second, in June, I'm launching the Coaches Club course and community. It's an eight-week online cohort course that helps coaches get better at teaching and leading. Too many coaches feel frustrated, alone, and unsupported in their coaching. The Coaches Club will connect you with other like-minded coaches from across sports that want to grow too. It consists of eight weekly masterclasses covering specific coaching topics, four one-on-one mentorship calls with me, and a lot more. Spots are limited and multiple spots have already been claimed. If you'd like to learn more, go to transformsport.org slash coaches club or email me at luke at transformsport.org. And if you want to reserve your spot today in the next cohort, go to transformsport.org slash free call or just click the link in the show details to schedule a call to talk with me today. Now to my conversation with JP Nurbin. I'm confident this conversation will help you get better at teaching and leading. Enjoy the episode. JP, I'd love to just start here. Uh, I think that most coaches recognize how important culture is. And I think most coaches want to have a great culture, but I think often um, as coaches, we neglect to kind of reflect on and examine how our own behaviors shape the team culture. So would you just talk about the importance of the coach's behavior in shaping a team's culture? Mm. I'll start with a story I, you know, that I've shared with people many times, but it's very personal to me. And, you know, I was always a passionate, energetic, hardworking coach. And I brought a lot of passion and enthusiasm. I wanted to make a difference. I wanted a culture that people wanted to be a part of. I wanted a culture, you know, that helped people to develop uh, their character, you know, and, um, but I remember kind of realizing that wasn't taking place in my teams or it was struggling to take place with a lot of individuals. And so I started really putting a lot of energy and a lot of time into, okay, character curriculums, leadership curriculums, lectures, videos, you know, just different, you know, setting standards and core values and preaching those things and putting up mantras on the wall and coming up with good slogans on the back of our t-shirt. But then there was this moment where we were going through a leadership curriculum lesson within my team. And uh, we had our leadership coach and he's talking about emotional control. And I'm in the back of the classroom sitting there kind of getting ready for the practice and we're in this you know, classroom setting here and I'm sitting in the back of my classroom underneath a, a, the poster of John Wooden's Pyramid of Success, um, which had his values, his core values that he really tried to you know, embody and teach. And uh, it was at that moment that I realized, whoa, my, one of the things that John Wooden used to teach was about how we ha- he had to 
model the values on that pyramid of success. Otherwise it would meant nothing. It would have been a, totally ineffective. And here my players are going through a lesson on emotional control. And I have the worst emotional control probably out of anybody on my team. So, you know, I was quick tempered. I was getting technicals. I was getting thrown out of games. I was swearing at my players, my team probably wouldn't swear at my players. I'd swear at my team, but you know, I was not embodying the type of things that we were trying to teach these kids. And so when it comes to our behaviors, first off, our behaviors set the tone as far as the example we set. That's the first and most important piece I would say, Luke, is just if we don't get our behaviors right and aligned with what we claim to value within our, our program and what we're trying to teach our players, none of it works. Yeah, I I agree. And I think I've experienced and seen it firsthand when when you preach something, but your behavior doesn't align with that it's confusing for kids and it's hard to hold them accountable to that standard if you're not doing it yourself to follow up on that. What in your experience, maybe it was, you mentioned some things for you personally, but then in your work with other coaches, like what are the most challenging behaviors for coaches to change that, that they often need to change to have a great culture that actually transforms kids' lives? Well, you know, there's actually, I would probably say to oversimplify. And anytime we oversimplify, we leave things out. But to oversimplify, I would say there's two different paths that coaches are typically need to change. And one is we would do what some might call the old school coaching, though I wouldn't use it that way. But old school coaching, hard, tough coaching, very stern, very strict um, we're telling players, we're lecturing players, we're punishing players, we're shaming, we're blaming them, we're yelling at them, not yelling to them, but we're yelling at them. Those type of behaviors, um, those would not fall in line with kind of what the what we talk about when it comes to transformational leadership. Those type of things have those 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 very strict type behaviors, punishing. They are effective in the short term. They're effective at getting people to sometimes comply, to do what we ask them to do. But at the same time, their long-term effects are not beneficial. They are not what we want to be really the outcomes that we want for them. Like if I asked any coach, like, hey, list out the five skills or qualities that you want to help develop in your players you know, they list them out. Then you look at all those types of coaching. Like that actually doesn't like yelling at them, telling them what to do, making them run. It's effective at getting them to work hard. But if you listed, you know, personal responsibility or intrinsically motivated or hardworking, like your own, you're not developing those skills by that type of, with that type of coaching, you're just developing or you're creating an environment and a culture and a relationship where they will do the things that you're asking them to do because you tell them to, and they're out of, out of fear. So that's the one aspect would be just very way, way too strict, way too, you know, for lack of uh, just for the, for the common term, old school, at the same time, there's the new age coach. There's the really permissive. I want to be your buddy and your friend, and I'm not going to hold you to a high standard. I'm not going to challenge you, or I'm going to be super positive and I'm going to give you false praise. And, you know, and not that, that, that we shouldn't be encouraging, but sometimes we go overboard with that. We're trying to give kids self-esteem or players self-esteem, which you, you can't give them. They have to earn it. They have to develop it. So the other side of that, and often just as harmful and detrimental, is this permissive, just allowing kids to kind of do whatever they want and not holding them to a standard. Um, neither is respectful of the individual. Neither is showing that you really believe in them and, and, and what they can accomplish. Yeah, it's really good. Talking about culture a little more, I would love to know um, in in your own experience and your work with coaches, uh, what are one or two really practical ways, your fav- favorite ways that coaches can shape their culture? Well, since we're, you know, I'll, I'll share two. One is more about things you can do with your team. And we'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but the first one is more about yourself since we're on this path. Every one of us has to grow as a leader. Everyone can do things better. You know, I turn on the TV and 
you, know, you watch some of these college basketball games in March Madness, and, and it's it's obvious where some people need to grow, <laughs> to, at least to me. Um, and it was obvious where I needed to grow to other people. But uh, we have to first to shape our culture. We need to first become aware of those areas. Am I too, you know, and just in those two thoughts earlier, am I too permissive? Am I too strict? You know, um, okay, how can I find this transformational way of of raising the standards and building relationships, relationships built on, on respect. So where can I grow on that? And so once we start to identify, for me, I was a yeller, I was a screamer, I would, uh, I was really, really intense. Um, and I started to have to, to really start to rein in my own, uh, you know, sort of manage my own emotions. And so I shared that with my players. So this is my first suggestion is, is share what you are working on with your players. We talk about growth mindset, have a growth mindset, have a growth mindset. You got to learn, you got to learn from your, you know, you got to learn and grow. Nothing is more powerful than actually modeling the growth mindset, than actually sharing, hey, this year I'm working on my self-control. When you do that, a few things happen. First off, once again, it comes back to you're modeling that growth mindset. They're like, oh, okay. Secondly, they're more likely to now take feedback from you because you have, um, you know, kind of shown how you're willing to almost take feedback from you, you know, from, from them, which is an important part of that. I, I started to share with my players and I, and this is so powerful when the coaches I work with, they start to share with their players, Hey, this is my area of growth for this practice or for this game or for this season. If you start to see me fall into old traps, this is how I want you to give me a little reminder. This is how I want you to encourage me as my players. And so my, I remember like losing it almost on this one referee in this game. And one of my seniors just like, or juniors turned to me. I'm just like patting me on the, tapping me on the shoulder and said, coach, coach, come on, come on. No, come on. That's not how you want to do things. That's not how you want to do things. Like, oh my gosh, that's so powerful when that happens for me because it makes me better. But now we have a growth culture. Now we're all in this together. So it just, it, not only is it modeling growth mindset and not only is it going to make you a better coach, but it will change the dynamic there. It will change the whole dynamic. So that will be the first thing. The second thing I would say, you have to, get, when it comes to your team, it's not, it, it would probably be, really focusing on improving your the use of questions. And there's two big types of questions I would encourage coaches to get better at. One is curious questions, open questions that are not going to be yes or no answers or, or short answers, open questions that you don't actually know the answer to, or you're genuinely curious what their answer is to it. You know, and that's an important type of question because it's discovering, it's learning about them, what's important to them how they see the world, how they see the team. The second one is, a, is what we call an open leading question. And a leading question is you kind of know an area where they got to grow. You might be leading them to a self-awareness about themselves, their own behaviors, their own attitude. You might be leading them to, you know, this observation that their, their, beha their, their behaviors, their habits aren't matching up with their goals. But like there's a lot of different types of leading questions, uh, but both are really, really powerful and they will start to transform the dynamic of the relationships and also empower individuals within your culture. That's really good. Are you talking about with those questions, asking those two kids or your players one-on-one -on -one or to the whole team? Um, so with those type of questions, you know, typically the, you know, they, they could be to both, you know, they really can. I, I don't think it's necessarily limited. Obviously the types of questions you might ask would be different, but like you might come in at halftime and you might have some open, curious questions that are, are pretty state, you know, pretty standard, which are you identified as a team before the game, you know, three areas, you know, one offense, one defense, and one team culture, you know, success criteria or emphasis. And they come in, okay, how are we doing on those things? And you generally want to know how they see what they're doing and what they can improve. Um, but if let's say, so those are curious questions, but let's say within that conversation, they're kind of like all over the place um, or they're really not on the point. They haven't really nailed down what they're struggling at. Let's say if it's a basketball game uh, on their rebounding, you know, they're like, well, you know, we're just struggling to finish the plays. Well, then you might start to lead them because you're like, okay, they got an idea of it, but then you might start to use leading questions to go, well, you know, they're actually most of their first shots have been here. So, you know, you start to lead them with other questions that would be more focused on 
discovering solutions, you know, or problems or issues. So it kind of varies. And you can also do them in a lot of individual conversations, which our coaches are doing constantly. They're asking them questions to their, to the players, uh, and, and these one-on-ones, uh, you know, various questions, curious questions to get to know more of the person leading questions, because you know, certain things that they maybe haven't, uh, realized, Hey, what's your effort on a scale of one to five? Well, you know, their efforts crap, you know, you know, it's like a two or a one out of five, but here you're kind of leading them to that, that awareness. That's really good. Kind of continuing with some issues around culture that lots of teams have. I don't think it's any secret that most teams and most coaches have a lot of difficulty with playing time and navigating playing time issues with players, with parents, all that, all that comes with team sports and playing time issues. Will you talk about those issues and the solutions that you found of them? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it kind of comes back to us as coaches. So if I looked at, if I got together with a football coaching staff, a hockey teams, basketball teams, volleyball teams, I've done this activity with coaches and I say, okay, um, hypothetically, you know, if it's early in the year, I like to go, who do you think is going to, you know, who, who's going to start, you know, pick your starting line, pick your depth chart. And they kind of, whatever it is, whether it be 10 players, 20 players, whatever type of team it is, they do depth chart. How many of those depth charts, let's say, for instance, in a staff of five actually match up? Zero. None of them do. So the staff itself can't fully 100% agree. Is there a lot of commonalities and similarities? Yes. But are they identical? No. Okay. So even in this very thing, a coaching staff would not agree on exactly that depth chart. And obviously, depending on the game, there's a lot of circumstances that, that might play into that. So What I'm trying to point out here is the other thing I would ask is like, okay, how do we determine playing time here? How do we make these decisions? Now, whatever coaches say is going to be vastly different from coach to coach in that own staff, because most coaches and most coaching staffs and most programs do not know exactly their process around determining playing time. And this is the first issue is we don't first off all agree upon it as a staff. Secondly, we don't agree on how we're going to decide that we don't also agree upon a common language and way to communicate that. So when it comes to communicating to our players and our parents, there's a huge problem there, you know, because we can't be good at that because we can't even communicate it to each other on on a coaching staff. So that's the first issue is we have to improve how we actually establish and determine playing time. The second way is we need to determine processes uh, in place to continuously communicate that playing time. Things like, uh, one thing is often a lot of our programs, if there's a shift in playing time, uh, roles or, or rotations, a coach will send out a Google form saying, how many minutes do you expect to play tonight in the first half or whatever? Um, and then they'll come back with, you know, and, and how are you best going to serve your team? Typically, it's that first question you look at. And then the coach can say, okay, well, this is how many minutes we have Luke playing. We think he's going to probably play in the first half, maybe 10 but Luke thinks he's playing 20. Whoa, we have a problem. So this is one of our many communicating systems where we go, we have a problem. Now we go have a conversation with Luke and we tell him, listen, Luke, this is where you are. We're sorry. We haven't communicated this, but we're making, so now he doesn't, you don't get emotional on the bench. Now it doesn't disrupt our culture because we've given you time to maybe accept that role. We've communicated that. And it doesn't, it's not perfect. There's a lot of different ways to continuously communicate. The last thing is just supporting players within those roles. And I think so often coaches go, okay, I'm going to support them by talking about how important their role is by giving a lecture to the team of like, oh, Luke's great, man. He does so much for the team and we appreciate you. And that's good. That's good. But that works for some players. But me and my personality, I didn't need that as a player. I needed actual, a coach that was invested in me that sat down and said, JP, this is what you need to work on. It may not get you more playing time, but this is what you need to work on. This is what you need to do. That type of attention in time, that showed me love and care and respect. And so it's about how we support players within roles as well. Yeah, that's really good. I think that's powerful. And it just goes such a long ways to making, making players who aren't playing feel valued when they know that you're still invested in their improvement, even if they're not on the court. 
Um, yeah. So I think that's a great, great point. I, I kind of want to circle back to something you mentioned at the beginning of that answer with uh, coaching staffs and that really some of it comes back to the staff isn't aligned. They're not on the same page. Um, I think a lot of coaches experience issues within the coaching staff. There's disunity, disagreement, like you said, lack of clarity, lack of alignment um, within staffs. So would you just talk about um, what you have experienced as the common issues that coaching staffs have within each other and what they can do about it? I'm very fortunate. I get to work and support coaches, Luke, that are really, really intentional about their growth. They're investing time that they don't have a lot of and money that they don't typically have a lot of because they're coaches in their growth. So when you have those two things, it makes for a special relationship. I'm fortunate that I will get to work to develop those coaches. But a lot of those, a lot of coaches, they're not fortunate that their staff always has that big growth mindset. There are certain limitations that keep coaches from being able to hire the dream staff, right? So I think one of the first things is just some people come in with a very fixed mindset towards their players. He stinks. We can't make him better, but also fixed mindset towards their own coaching. This is who I am. You know, um, this is how I'm going to coach. That's one thing. The other thing is just, uh, is the vision. Some coaches have a very transformational type vision. They want to make a difference. Other coaches are out to prove something. Um, they're out to get something. They want to move up the ranks. And so if you have a very transactional coach, but you're a transformational coach, you have two different visions. The third big issue I would say really comes down to commitment. Some coaches can only give so much because they're at a certain level, you know, middle school, high school, they have other jobs. You're not paying them full time. Um, and even just the full time coaches at the division one level, like there's a level of commitment to certain things that you might ask out of them, reading in the off season, staff meetings that they may not always be great at. So, um, you know, those are kind of like the three areas I think as, as far as level of commitment, uh, growth mindset, and then the vision for, you know, of, of what a, a coach is and the impact that we want to have that when those that, that I think coaches struggle with probably the most dangerous is growth mindset. Like I'll take a transactional coach that has a growth mindset before I take a transformational coach with a fixed mindset, which is kind of an you know, oxymoron doesn't really happen. Part of being transformational is having a growth mindset. But like my, my point there is like, there are a lot of coaches that want to make a difference out there and they care about their players, but they're not willing to do the work to learn and grow at that, you know, like, and that's, that's pretty dangerous as well too. So uh, I, either way, those are probably the three common areas I see staff struggle. Yeah, that's, that's really good. And I think I would agree with you on those things. Um, kind of circling back to some things you mentioned earlier uh, with coaches behavior and even some of what you were just talking about. Um, will you talk more about one, the importance of, and two, what have you found to be a good process of reflection uh, for coaches that want to grow? Like how can they reflect effectively and kind of have a process in place for that, that aids them in continuing to grow as a coach? One is, is first off a personal reflection on their own self. And I think so coaching is so emotionally and mentally exhausting at times. You know, even when you got a strong culture, it can be draining. The stronger your culture, more player led, stronger staff, it becomes less draining. But there's gonna be moments where it is very, very um, taxing. So we have to be reflecting on ourselves. And um, so I think journaling or just spending time in solitude is, is, is really, really important. How am I feeling? Where's my thinking at? You know, um, making sure you're putting in the important rocks first in your day, whether it be exercise, prayer, meditation, family time, healthy eating, those type of things, proper sleep. But like spending time in reflection and journaling, coming back to your principles, your why, some days that's very mundane for me. Some days it's very routine and I don't feel like the effects of it, but it's incredible what it's done for me in the last six, seven years to have built that habit. You know, it's so important. And secondly, it helps me to 
also observe my behavior. Oh gosh, where am I struggling in certain relationships? Why am I, how have I contributed to this challenge? Um, but also like, where is this person struggling? Oh, they're having a really tough time. How can I better serve that player? How can I, you know? So I think that's the big thing is first off is just a bit of like a journaling or a time of solitude that coaches could build into their mornings or their evenings. For me, it's in the mornings. And that's sometimes five minutes to 10 minutes to 15 minutes, anywhere in that window, you know? Um, and the other thing I would say is just a post-practice and post-game reflection. This is, there's a lot of different ways you could approach it with, you know, WhatsApp groups or group text and, you know, putting it on your practice plan. But the number one thing coaches need to do is they need to stop leaving a game or practice and reflecting first on their players. We so often we start with, well, Luke was lazy today or Luke, man, Luke was in, a, he could not throw it in the ocean. Instead, we need to start reflecting first with ourselves. What were the things that I was trying to do? What was success for me in this practice or this game? How, you know, knowing that going into it and then reflecting on those criteria, those focus, those factors, those emphasis, whatever they are, whatever you want to call them, reflecting on, okay, how did I do in those areas? Those things that I said I was going to try to work and improve on, asking more questions, leading with questions, connecting with every player. Maybe that was the goal of my practice was to connect with every player at one point. Did I do that? Did I accomplish that? Okay, I didn't. Well, how can I do a better job of it? And the second thing, after you reflect on yourself, is to start to then reflect on your team and your players. And, and if you can start to change that, because so often coaches finish the game and they head to, you know, out for dinner or they're for drinks, their staff, or they just, you know, chat and they're just complaining. They're just talking about the negatives of everything there. And so you have to be intentional. And I think that intentionality starts with first off yourself. And then secondly, limiting what you're trying to reflect on. Can't reflect on everything because then you just get 20,000 issues. So reflect on the things that you said you were really going to work on in that, that practice or game. Yeah, that's so powerful. And it just kind of reminded me of, um, you had Mono Watts on your podcast, um, a couple of weeks ago, and he just talked about the importance and power of leaders going first and, and taking that look at yourself before you look at others, I think is so powerful. And, and like to circle back to what you said earlier, and then to be able to take some of those things and to share them with your team and to model that, hey, I reflect and then I share and, I, and I'm striving to grow. Um, I, I think it's so powerful when they see that. Let me share an example of that too with you really quick, Luke, because I was coaching a women's professional team here in Ireland um, earlier this year before we got shut down with COVID. And um you know, about once a week, I, I would ask my players, I'd break them off into their leadership council units and they'd be in a, with three or four players. And I'd ask them to reflect self, team, and then coach. And then after that practice, they had to share each of me, each of them sent me a text, their own reflection on themselves, reflection on the team and the practice. And then w- the captain, the head of that unit would send me a reflection on what they agreed upon as far as feedback for me as a coach. Because I knew at that stage that, They individually weren't going to feel confident enough to give me hard feedback, but collectively they could probably say, well, we said, you know, coach, you need to be tougher on us. You need to be better communicator. You you could have done more of this stepped in. And that feedback was really, really good. And uh, that process was intentional. And um, so I think, you know, that's just one way of, of, of what it kind of looks like. So I just thought I'd share that with you. That's really good. And, And did you say that you were just doing that right at the end of your practices? Yeah, we'd finish up practices. It'd probably be like a Sunday practice and we'd have gone, you know, four practices that week. So I just said, you know, well, let's fo- I might focus on that practice or I might say, hey, as the week as a whole, but typically I would say in, in this last practice, you know, uh, yeah, we would do that. They would have a discussion, but then they would leave and then mm-hmm. they would text me. So. Yeah, I like that. That's really good. Super practical. And um, I think it's can be very humbling to ask for and get feedback from your own players. Um, so I... I like that a lot. Um, Kind of shifting a little bit, uh, you talk a lot about and have used the competitive cauldron pretty extensively. So I would just love to get kind of really practical about what the competitive cauldron is and how it can help coaches create more competitive practices, because I think most coaches would agree that they want that. Yeah. I I mean, at the end of the day, there's going to be some people that will say, Oh, that's, that's, that seems a little bit harsh for players, but the reality is we do want competitive practices 
And we, I've tried a million different ways to increase competition. One is like, we make things competitive. Losers run. That's probably the most common thing. I've offered rewards for amount of wins. You win so many games or this and this, and you can get a free Gatorade. And we would keep track of these, like these points, these wins. Uh, but uh, the competitive cauldron, which I guess Anson Dorrance got it from Dean Smith. And then Steve Carroll's got it from Anson Dorrance and lots of other coaches are using it at the professional level. I've used it at the youth level all the way down to the church basketball team that I spoke with you about off air, but in a different format is just charting winners and losers in practice and trying to do as many games as possible um, within the time that you're a lot, even if you're playing one-on-one play like three or four games of one-on-one in 10 minutes instead of just one game. And it just creates a lot of opportunities for everybody to win. You get a lot of data. You can use that data and um, you put it into, we've created a spreadsheet that makes it super easy for coaches that ranks those players. And so what we move away from and we don't talk a lot about it. You just, I encourage coaches to just post it, to just share it with their players once they've got enough data and that's it. Just post it. You shouldn't have to do much else for that with players. You know that it doesn't have to directly impact playing time. Um, you don't need to talk about, well, you're the last and you're the first, or it's just more of like, it's there. And our natural instincts is, especially in men's sports is going to be to want to get to the top with the women's sports. You have to be a little bit more, um, you know, careful about how you roll that out. And, um, maybe you might not share it publicly in the locker room, but you might share it on a group chat, um, or you might share it in just one-on-one meetings. Hey, this is where you're at, you know, because you don't want to make people feel bad. And it just, so different things like that, but we essentially you're just, you're creating and you're charting. And here's the thing. So often we get to these parent conversations in high school, even college sports with coaches I support. And the parents are like, well, why is he not playing? Well, he's not one of the better players. He's got these players in front of him. But every time he gets in the game, how do you know that? Because every time he gets in the game, you know, he, he, you pull him out every time he makes a mistake. Well, you know, there's all this data that we see and all the stuff we see in practice, but we don't have a way of sharing that information of what we see. And that is just one little data point that has actually transformed parent conversations. Had one parent of a coach at the collegiate level and this parent um, was always on for like the last freshman and sophomore year complaining about the role and, or not even complaining as much as is concerned. And then finally they're a junior and they think that this player is going to play a lot and they're not, they're not competing well in practice. And uh, the coach just said, listen, your son's not competing. He's not getting after him practice. He's near the bottom of our cauldron in our one-on-ones and our three-on-threes and our five-on-fives. Sends it off to parent. Coach, very sorry. Did not realize that. That was the response. You know, I don't know of any other way that you can frame that conversation, you know, that that you get the point across so simply and so quickly, you know, but he's like, oh my gosh, he <laughs> is it, you know? So little things like that. Yeah. I like that a lot. And, and just having some data to honestly share with parents and players, here's where you're at. I think that it just increases clarity and transparency. And I think that parents and players, they want that. They want to know where they stand. And too often, I think they, they feel like they're left in the dark in large part, because as coaches, we don't know how we're making the decisions we're making or evaluating what we're evaluating. Um, the last thing I want to do is just ask you some, some rapid fire questions and just kind of hear the first thing that comes to your mind. Um, and then I'll give you a chance to share with people about your work and, and where they can find it. Um, here's the first one. The most fun part of coaching is blank. Mentoring. Say more about that. Mentoring is about three things to me. It's, it's about first off affirming people, you know, helping them to feel affirmed in what they're doing, what they know. It's also being at an even deeper level, a sounding board for them. Someone they can go to when they don't know certain things, they know that and they need advice at the deepest level. It helps people to discover things they don't know. They don't know. Sometimes those are good things. And sometimes those are things that are blind spots that are holding them back and hurting themselves and hurting other people. And as a mentor, we can uh, 
build a relationship that's meaningful, that's lasting, and that is truly impactful in people's lives. Mm. I love it. Here's the next one. I wish I would have known blank before my first coaching experience. First thing that comes to your mind. I wish I knew that there was a better way than yelling <laughs> and shouting and, and, and screaming at my players. I, I just think I was able to make a really big impact in a lot of kids' lives early on through my passion, enthusiasm, and hard work. There's a lot of kids that I hurt along the way or I ostracized or I lost off my team because I didn't realize there was a better way of doing things. And there is a better way. There's a better way of connecting and, and, and supporting people and holding people accountable. And had I known that, I could have, I could have impacted more lives. Yeah, that's powerful. Last rapid fire question. I know I'm successful as a coach when blank. I've created a culture where three things are happening. People have an enjoyable, positive experience. People are growing. People can't be a part of the program and not get better as a person. And I'd say the third thing that I would determine that success would really come down to performing at a high level. We're pursuing excellence. You know, we, we, we are achieving great results. We're winning or, you know, we're, we're, we're tapping to, close to the top of our ceiling of a potential. Yeah. I love it. Uh, well, JP, this has been awesome. Uh, tell people how they can connect with you and, and find your work. Uh, you can head on over to thriveonchallenge.com at my website. There I offer a lot of free resources for coaches on playing time. Um, some of the information around the, some of these systems and um, culture transformation kit. It's kind of a couple like uh, really practical team activities that you can do to kind of hit the reset on your culture if you feel like it's struggling. You can also see my book calling up is, is there. It's available. Um, it's also available on Amazon. Um, there's some online courses for other coaches that maybe want to invest. If you've got 50, hundred bucks in the off season to, to kind of like grow your coaching and you really want to go through a 30 minute to an hour long course and get the resources upon which to implement some of these strategies, like the competitive cauldron, uh, you can check out at, at my website as well. And, and, and lastly, I mean, you can learn more about how we, we do support coaches in a very personalized relationship through our mentorship program and community. Uh, of, of college and high school and professional coaches all around the world. Coaches, thanks for listening to this episode. And thanks again to JP for coming out of the podcast. If you'd like a free copy of the notes from this episode, go to transformsport.org slash pod notes, or click the link in the show details to get a free copy of the notes from this episode and every episode. If you enjoyed the episode, please take a minute to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts, and give us a shout out on Twitter, at CoachesClub underscore. Thanks for listening to the Coaches Club podcast powered by Transform Sport, where we believe great coaches transform lives, athletes deserve great coaches, and coaches deserve great training.